Welcome to the Marshan and Oran Sports Media Podcast Year in Review for 2021. John, it's been a pleasure doing this podcast with you, and I'm looking forward to next year already. Yeah, man, this has been everything that we wanted it to be when we launched it. It was you know, two people that are breaking most of the stories in sports media, just talking about it and having fun doing it. I'm, I'm having a blast so far. We're going to go who's up, who's down like we normally do, but for the whole year, we're going to hit on topics, you know, the NFL, big money for talent, uh, all the new deals, NHL, uh, Premier League, MLB. Uh, we'll go top. We'll talk about the cable bundle. Maria Taylor's moved to NBC and all that. Uh, Amazon joining the fun. We'll have our calls of the year. Maybe we'll have some mystery topics as we go along as well. We start as we always do with who's up and who's down. Who's up? Who's down? John, you go first. Who do you have for your who's up for the whole year for 2021? What an honor. The Marshand and Oran Sports Media Podcast. Who's up for 2021? Burke Magnus of ESPN. I was going to do Jimmy. Well, that was like, oh, that yours? Okay, I will do mine in a second. Okay. Oh, mine carries a little more weight, I would think. I mean, come oh, on. Yours man. does have more weight. <laughs> I mean, well, you are kissing some fannies here, but go ahead. Hey, listen, I wanted to do Jimmy Pataro, but I decided to do uh, the deal maker. Burke Magnus, over the last two years, has done more deals than anybody, maybe in sports uh, media history, considering all the deals that he put into ESPN Plus, just the past two years alone, deals with the NFL, MLB, NHL, PGA Tour, La Liga, SEC, Wimbledon. He has done yeoman's work, getting a ton of rights to Disney and ESPN and also across ESPN Plus. And I think it's a no brainer for Burke. Okay. Um, I'm going to go my who's up. I'm going to stay with ESPN, the Manning cast. Peyton Manning has been the white whale of sports media executives uh, who have wanted him to call games. Uh, CBS, uh, a couple of years ago, right before they did the huge Tony Romo $180 million deal, tried to call an audible and get Peyton Manning. Uh, Thursday night football with Fox, they tried to get Peyton Manning. Amazon had thoughts about him, but ESPN landed him. I mean, what a deal it is for Peyton Manning, 10 games. Uh, he works from home, basically, uh, and he picks the games. It's amazing, but it worked out for ESPN as well. It's been a huge success. He and Eli Manning uh, have a very good chemistry, and that has lifted up uh, Monday Night Football. So they get my who's up for 2021. All right. And you can, you can, and you can understand why he was a white whale by how popular that uh, the Manning cast has been, right? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I think kind of actually works to the advantage that it's not every week. It makes it a little bit more special when it's on. Uh, so I'm not sure if you're, I don't think they're going to mess with that formula because I don't think the Manning's want to, number one. But number two, I, I actually think it's kind of an advantage. Less is more a lot of times with these situations. All right. Now I just said less is more. We're going to do who's down. <laughs> I will tell you, uh, this person is probably going to think more is less. <laughs> who's down uh, for John Oran? Should this come as any surprise to anybody that's been listening to this podcast regularly, who's down Chris Ripley of Sinclair. And there goes oh, every, gosh, every single S Sinclair scoop I've ever had is, is out the window now. But con consider this, Andrew. Ripley bought the Fox Sports RSNs from Disney in 2019 for about $11 billion. I think it's closer to $14 billion if you throw in the, the stake in Yes Network. They've lost nearly half that value in just about two years. The future of these RSNs, uh, not, not, they're now called Bat Valley Sports RSNs, is a huge question mark, and that's putting it as nicely as I possibly can. Distributors like Dish Network have become emboldened about dropping these RSNs. We've never seen that before in, in, in the cable bundle. People typically, the distributors typically, were terrified to drop live sports like the, like the local RSNs. MLB Commissioner Rob Manfred, NBA Commissioner Adam Silver, they've both been on record bashing Ripley and bashing Sinclair and the RSN strategy. And I, I think 2021 was a miserable year for the Bally Sports RSNs. Yeah. One thing I want to say, though, about you, you as you said at the beginning with the, the source thing, and you'll never break a story. What people don't understand who, when, you, when you break stories, it's not always 
I mean, it's usually not, at least for me, it's not, well, they like you. It's also a lot of people don't like you. So you might, you might do okay with Sinclair because there's a lot of people who say, you know what, Sinclair is terrible. And um, like, I think like, Let me tell you how terrible they are and, and, get, and get you that way. Absolutely. Yeah. So it, it goes, it goes a, a bunch of different ways. All right. For my who's down, speaking of leaked stories uh, is Rachel Nichols. Uh, Rachel Nichols a year ago at this time was flying high. Uh, the face of ESPN's NBA studio coverage, uh, along with Maria Taylor. Uh, now she's not on ESPN anymore. She's getting paid for her final year. I do think you'll see a comeback from her uh, in 2022. She made a mistake, but she was privately taped. Uh, we, we've gone through this uh, before. I just think it was a terrible year for Rachel Nichols. So uh, not necessarily totally her fault. In fact, uh, in a lot of ways, not her fault in, in some regards, but uh, she's my who's down for 2021. All right, Andrew, let me dive into that for a quick second, because you said a, a few things there. You expect to come back in 2022. Uh, what do you see possibly happening there? Look, I don't think anything's going on yet, but if she wants to get back into the sports space, I do think Adam Silver's comments about you shouldn't be judged by one mistake. So I could see maybe an NBA TV, which is first where she could be her on-ramp back into mainstream sports TV. Uh, but she could go in another direction and, and try something different. She can write. She's talented. Uh, she was very popular within NBA circles. Uh, before internally, she uh, did not have enough people stand up for her uh, when things uh, went south, when the New York Times published her um, private comments that really uh, alleged that ESPN uh, was trying to make up for their poor diversity record in her estimation. Like, I don't know, I have any inside information on this, but I, I think she'll, she'll try to make a comeback uh, in 2022. I, I foresee that. Yeah, I don't want to t turn this into a, a bonus topic, but I do think ESPN actually uh, amazingly benefited from it because it allowed them to blow up a pregame show that just really wasn't working. And they're, they're trying to something new with a new pregame show. I haven't seen it a t a enough to, in order to, to make a, a judgment, but I like what I've seen so far. It, it's solid enough. We will get into this a little bit further. Uh, deeper down the rundown, I have that as topic five. All right, so why don't we move right into the topics? Uh, topic one, when we look at the NFL deals, what's your first, your biggest takeaway from these NFL deals that they made? They're for $110 billion. They're for 12 <laughs> years. Amazon's for 13 years. They get the exclusive rights till Thursday. Everything else is basically the same. Um, what's your takeaway? Two things. One, $110 billion billion dollars in a cord cutting environment where, where fewer people are watching uh, regular television is, is one. And uh, number two is 11 years from now in the 2030s, if you want to watch NFL football, you can watch it on broadcast television, except for the Thursday night games, which are going to be exclusive to Amazon, except for in the local markets. That to me is such a huge bet on just linear television. So while we all talk about, and one of the themes of the podcast, and one of the themes that I've been writing about for a decade is about all these digital companies that are coming in and just waiting to spend money on these live rights. It's actually the traditional old boring broadcasters that have really just tied up the biggest sport in the country by far and uh, for, for more than a decade. And I, I, I just, I found that to be, you know, just uh, my, my biggest takeaway. Yeah, and the ratings for the NFL this year have been through the roof as the fans returned uh, to stadiums, which, which created excitement, uh, and the NFL is dominant. Other storylines this year, we talked about the Manning cast. That's a big win for ESPN. Monday Night Football, the main booth, still have some questions about that. Uh, Greg Olson uh, came in for Fox. He's been really good uh, at the number two spot. And then at NBC who has the Super Bowl in February coming up. Uh, Al Michaels is in his final year as their number one play-by-player. -player. Michelle Tafoya uh, is going to be, I, I reported last week, uh, there's going to be her final year on the sideline. They had brought in Drew Brees as a possibility to replace Chris Collinsworth, but Collinsworth looks like he's going to remain as the analyst. So changing of the guard there as well. Let me uh, dive into the Michelle Tafoya thing, because you've been all over this story. 
Uh, why is she leaving? So NBC is declining comment uh, and Tafoya has not said anything yet uh, publicly. But I think if you look at what kind of caused the conspiracy about the view appearance, I think that was kind of telling. I think when she showed up in the view, I was kind of like, oh, that's kind of odd. You know, Michelle Tafoya doesn't really do that much other stuff. And I think that could be um, the direction that she goes, maybe gets into politics. Um, she uh, does lean to the right uh, in terms of her views that she's, she's made that clear over the years and, and the view appearance as well. Uh, so I could see her trying to be a political commentator. And I also think she's been on the sideline a long time. Uh, she's done Olympics. She's done very well. She's had a, a, a very good career uh, as a sports reporter. Uh, but I do think there's a part of it that sometimes comes in where been there, done that, and she's just doing it again and again. Uh, so she doesn't need to do it um, again. So basically her view appearance did factor in to her decision, but not because NBC said, we want you out more that she said, I need to branch out and do more than just do sideline reporting for the NFL. Okay, let me address that on the pod, just for the in terms of the view appearance and what happened. Okay, well, because so this- I, I mean, it, it, uh, so I'm not reporting out this story. It does feel like, you know, uh, ca- cause and effect. And if yeah, it's one not happened though. right it's after not the though. other. I get it. We live in a world now where people just can take their facts and put them again. This is what reporting does. This is I always say about reporting too in, in this day and age. People want to know things two seconds later and reporting doesn't, sometimes it's two seconds, but a lot of times you got to make calls and people don't call you back and all this other stuff. Uh, and you got to make sure it's right. Uh, so just look at the facts. She was on The View. Then she was on three more games. She was on the rest of November. There was no suspension. That doesn't add up. There was no suspension. Then she was off the week, the Sunday after Thanksgiving to be with her family. Uh, And then she, uh, there were cold weather games. I know she lives in Minnesota, but she's standing on the sideline. I don't think she wanted to do that. She's also going to be off January 2nd, uh, which is a game in Green Bay. So I I don't know. I think she might've been hesitant to, uh, to come back this year uh, to do it. The Super Bowl year. Uh, and so when you look at it, there's not cause and effect. I just found out I did, I went deeper and tried to find out what was going on. And I found out, okay, well, this is her last year uh, on the sideline for NBC. So I get it, how it looks cause and effect, but when you report it out, it just doesn't add up no matter what people want to think. And, and I get it, I get how it, like the narrative looks, but it, it's just not accurate. One other thing that I want to get into but before we leave the NFL is a, a name that has to come up in 2021, and that's Bob Chapek, the, uh, the head of, uh, of Disney. And if you, if you look, uh, Fox more than doubled what it's paying the NFL in, in the New Deal. Same with NBC, same with CBS. ESPN, uh, they're only, I'm putting air quotes in here, they're only paying about a 30 to 40% increase over, over what they have been paying. Granted, they were always paying a lot more at ESPN. They always had the, the worst deal out of everybody, but now it's coming back into play. And I credit a lot of that, not to Burke Magnus, sorry, Burke, but to Bob Chapek, sort of, he's he's the numbers guy from Disney coming in. I've been reporting, he had the NFL convinced, and he had me convinced too, that he was willing to walk on, on Monday Night Football if, if they were going to try to make them pay double. And I think the whole idea is that there isn't another media company out there that would be paying, you know, more, uh, $4 billion for the rights to, to, to Monday Night Football. It's, you know, it, it started going up too high. That was, even though they ended up paying 30% higher on an already inflated uh, uh, fee, that was just the deal of the year, in my opinion. Yeah, I'm less impressed than you are with that. Uh, because I just think they're, they had such a terrible deal that they had under Skipper and company uh, where they were just paying so much more for the worst package that you couldn't just say, well, we're going to go and double it again uh, and not get th- that said, they did do much better. The, I think Monday night football starting with the Mannings is, and then they're going to have some flex scheduling coming up in the next couple of years. Um, it's a way better package. They're going to better games. Um, as you've talked about, better distribution with ABC and the Manning cast and all that stuff. And they figure it'd be, it's going to become more of a marquee again. Uh, that said, when you're coming from the bottom, I mean, there's more to go. So I just think the others, like I look at NBC's deal, I think it's pretty good. They got the number one show in prime time and they're paying just a little, you know, less than 2 billion uh, for theirs. Um, and I think CBS and Fox, uh, those Sunday you know, afternoons are the highest rated. So 
I think the other one just had better deals throughout the year. So I'm just a little less impressed than you are. Um, you love, are they going to be at like, were they at Christmas? Are they going to be at Christmas with you? The, the Chapek, Magnus, Pataro. It's like, uh, <laughs> hey, kids. I better get something under the tree from those guys. I mean, this, this pod is, uh, is, is powerful, isn't it? Let's move the topic to John. Big money for talent. All right. This has uh, been a year where uh, the money has increased uh, you have Pat McAfee with his recent deal, $30 million uh, with FanDuel. Stephen A. Smith's contract. Oh, no. for tw- Everybody take a drink. He brought up the Stephen A. Smith deal. Just like <laughs> that. Yeah, like I even said, said it. You would. Yeah, exactly. Wait, we're going to have to flash back when Van Pelt said that. I don't know if you get a dollar every time you write that Stephen A. Smith makes $12 million. If you did, you must, you'd have $12 million. If you, if you got a dollar for every time you wrote it, Marcia, you'd, you'd have $12 million. <laughs> The math didn't really work out there with Van Pelt, I got to tell you. But Stephen A. Smith, $12 million, a lot of power as well. He wanted, uh, you know, magic. He wanted Wilbon in the NBA countdown uh, reboot, and he got them. Greenberg's the host. Uh, Stephen A., very powerful at ESPN. uh, And uh, we are going to see that. Now, this is what we're seeing kind of in sports media, these, the high is going to be even get higher and higher. I think with the gambling money being infused uh, into uh, sports media and then the low, it's the middle class that I'm not positive about. If you can't just directly point to something that's yours um, or if you don't have like a friend in high places, uh, you're a little bit, uh, you're not in the best position. Back in uh, 2013, like eight years ago, when FS1 launched, there was you had FS1, you had NBC uh, Sports Network, you had ESPN, and you had these bidding wars going for studio hosts, for newsreaders, and you saw you know that middle class you, you talked about, they all took this gigantic step up, and it was all about who could present well on on television. Well, what you're, what you're describing now is completely different. It's a Pat McAfee started at Barstool, you know, and does a little WWE here. He hosts his own uh, serious show, multi-platform. Uh, Stephen A. Smith is, uh, you know, he's one of, you know, if we were, were to do the top three talent at ESPN, he certainly would be within the, the, the top three there, if not the top one uh, in terms of recognizability. The difference now in terms of uh, like what they're paying for, and it's these gambling companies that want information. So they're going after these info guys. So Schefter, when his, his contract is up, he's going to be making a boatload uh, off of that. And, and it, it's about multi-platform. And the people that decided that, that saw what was happening in 2013, 2014, and wanted to figure out how to be a great sports center host, uh, they're stuck now. I mean, you've got to be able to provide more than that. Look, I do think these networks are going to make all these excuses about this, that, and the other thing. And uh, in terms of not paying people or not traveling, if we can get past the pandemic even further. But I think when you look at it, they're going to get, they're getting a huge infusion of money uh, with uh, the gambling. So uh, they really should be paying everyone more. So raises for everybody. I'm telling you, tell your buddies at your Christmas dinner, uh, Pataro and company, that everyone deserves a raise at ESPN. <laughs> now, enough of this uh, cutting salary stuff, all right? Enough with that. All right, yeah, out sorry. with that. That's on the way down. We want <laughs> salaries on the way up. This is how you get popular, John. I'm teaching here. Everyone listening now, all the broadcasters are listening, they're like, yeah, tell them, Marshan. Yeah. All right. Marshan's going to double as a sports agent. I love it. Yes. Talent agent right here. I thought about it. I thought I would go to agents. The guy's... Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, anyway, I could make a comment there, which I won't. All right, topic three, NHL, Premier League, Major League Baseball. I kind of forget about that one. Uh, John, give me your takeaway when you think about these deals. You know, PGA Tour uh, deal it gets it, it snuck in there as well. Okay. Since I started doing this, we've been writing about the sports rights bubble. And the sports rights bubble, it did exist, but it exists for sort of the have-nots. You're going to have the top leagues and they're going to get increases. And that's what we saw with the NFL. That's what we saw with the NHL, which uh, left uh, NBC. It got more money from Turner and, and ESPN combined. Uh, that's what we saw with the Premier League, which uh, you know NBC just really paid up for uh, to keep. Uh, MLB uh, is, saw a significant increase from Fox and, and Turner. ESPN's paying a little bit less uh, th- than they had been. Again, Bob Chapek uh, getting in there. One of the stories, I don't know the answer to this yet. I don't know who does, but the question is, where do you draw the line? Is MLS going to fall 
over that line or under that line? Because that line is is definitely uh, has definitely been drawn. If, and if you're a Conference USA, let's say there's there's not a lot out there uh, for you because you know that you're more about tonnage than anything else. But if you're a premier sports league and the NBA rights are are going to be coming up in in the next couple of years, you're you're looking fine in this in this era because all of these big media companies they need live sports to exist. Yeah, I thought uh, Mike Mulvihill from Fox Executive, who does a lot of their numbers and their planning and uh, uh, and trying to figure out where things are going, he had an interesting tweet about how streaming has plateaued a little bit. Uh, when we talk about all this stuff, you know, all this is designed to get people direct to consumer. I do think it's very fascinating how uh, places are taking different approaches to the upcoming new world with direct to consumer. Uh, ESPN's all in, uh, NBC, CBS kind of in, not on everything, but have added a lot of things um, and, and spending some money. Fox is basically sitting it out at the moment saying, we're just going to go and, and, and focus on our broadcast and cable, let everyone else spend money and let them figure it out. And that's an interesting strategy as well. I, I kind of like ESPN's and Fox's extremes. I just feel like that's where it is. I think you're all in and all out. And then HBO Max uh, and Discovery coming in, they're going to spend a lot of money, uh, which is going to you know further uh, add uh, bidders for the you know upcoming rights, there's not a lot of them coming up. There's the Big Ten. There's MLS. I, I'm I'm not bullish on MLS getting a great uh, a great number again, an increase, but not a great number um, because I just don't think the games don't rate well enough. So I just think that's going to drive prices down. And the streamers already have soccer. Like how many more soccer fans are there? How many MLS fans are there who don't like La Liga or who don't like uh, Syria, uh, I don't think uh, NBC with the Premier League, they're going to be involved in MLS. Uh, so you take that off the board. Uh, I don't know. I just think watching the games, MLS, again, very good experience in arena, in stadium, but uh, not yet there in terms of uh, the product as a TV slash direct to consumer offering. Yeah, uh, NBC almost certainly is out. I mean, everybody's going to talk, so it's, it's hard to say that they're out. Our reporting has said that Fox is is uh, very unlikely uh, to to uh, to get in there and renew. CBS is a big question mark. I've heard that they're not particularly interested in MLS, but with uh, Paramount Plus, they have invested a lot in soccer. So could that turn? You know, we'll wait and see. Uh, I, I think that the the one thing going for uh, MLS is that soccer is a very hot property now uh, to, uh, to, uh, to these uh, media companies. The reason that soccer is a hot a property is because, not because of the TV ratings, which uh, you and I are sort of TV focused and MLS can't run away from those ratings. They're very small, but it's because people that like soccer or people that like specific soccer leagues, they're more apt to subscribe to the streaming service to, to watch to watch their league and watch their sport. And so that's why, like, it, when you talk about uh, David Zaslov of Discovery coming up when he, when he takes Warner Media, I think they'll they'll be interested. I know ESPN's interested in, in getting in getting something for ESPN Plus, much more so than for ESPN or for uh, or for ABC. I don't know if people are finding those games. I just think like you look at the Bundesliga, you know, German league, and. The ESPN doesn't tell us how many people are streaming those um, games, those matches. Uh, but I just yeah. But again, it- you have to like you, you have to redirect how you're viewing this. It's it's less about the number of streams, which almost certainly is very low, especially compared to, to television. It's about how many people actually signed up for the service and are keeping the service based on oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna actually watch a Bundesliga at some point. But I, I get you there. I, you know, you're right, but. I don't know if that works as a long-term plan if you're the league when your contract comes up because ESPN is going to look, well, this is how many people are streaming this. So this is what it's worth to us now. And then secondly, um, I just, I think there is something you still do want to find that sweet spot, which the NFL, of course, they have all the power. They found it. Uh, They're going to dip their toe in Amazon and then, uh, still have everything, you know, have the most distribution. And so they, they understand it. They have all the power to do that. Uh, MLS doesn't have that power. So, but I do think they'd be making a mistake if they can't get a number of games on either at least cable or broadcast. 
Couldn't agree with you more. I, I, look, our job generally is to uh, weed out and edit out corporate buzzwords, but there's a corporate buzzword, discoverability. I don't think that's, is that a word? I'm not sure if it's an actual word or not, <laughs> but that's what, that's what people, it's, it's a big problem. How can you find these games? The NHL is finding this right now. Like, where is my game? Is it on Hulu? Is it on ESPN Plus? Is it on Turner? Is it on ESPN? It's not very easy to find right now because it went, as, at least not as easy as it was when you had four channels or when you just had a cable system where you, you, could, you could look at it that way. And that's something that really has to be addressed even by top leagues like the NHL, much less uh, smaller leagues like, like the Bundesliga. Well, I will say that Turner's had MLB playoffs for 14 years. And I still, every year, it's like, where is it? Uh, you also do <laughs> How about that one NBA game they put on NBA TV? It's like, wait, what? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You can't just Google it. Of course we move the to topic for the cable bundle, the unwinding of it. Uh, your buddy, the head of uh, Sinclair, Chris Ripley, you can rip on him again. Uh, go for it, John. <laughs> Over the weekend, all of the Disney channels, including the ESPN channels, they all went dark on, on YouTube TV and they stayed off for about a day and a half and then YouTube came back and, 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 and uh, got them back. And what I found interesting about that is that the leverage has turned back to the networks, especially when it comes to these virtual like YouTube TV, because I can cancel YouTube TV tomorrow, but uh, Xfinity, they signed me up for like a two year deal. I'm stuck with them. So if they're having these fights, I can't, I can't really leave. And I, I also have the internet from Xfinity and a, a landline. I still do have a landline from, from Xfinity. So it's, it's just harder to unwind all of that. But YouTube TV, it's just a, a streaming service. You don't have the bowl game. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to drop you and pick up another service that actually has that bowl game. And I, uh, what undoubtedly happened is that uh, YouTube TV saw a bunch of people drop their service to where they had to go and, and, and cut a deal immediately. And you could tell from the statements that came out, you know, very corporate statements, but you could tell Disney was like, yeah, oh, we got the market price. And it was obvious to me that YouTube so, sort of buckled on that one. I think that, that that's a, a bellwether because it suggests a change in leverage back to the networks when it comes to those video uh, service providers. All right, John, let's look at the other aspects of the cable bundle, NBC, SN, shuttering at the end of the year. ACC Network began this year. So what's your take on, on those two things? Court cutting exists and, 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 it, and it's happening and it's, it's killing these distributors and it's killing, especially ESPN that gets paid by the subscriber. As the number of subscribers continue to drop, you're going to see networks like NBC and like ESPN uh, allow distributors to be, become more flexible in terms of the packages that they put out there. One of the things about YouTube TV is that it became popular because they have a, a, a small package that's relatively affordable. C the cable bundle is still this unwieldy package with hundreds of channels. I only wanna watch four or five. So I think what you're, what you're seeing here is NBC decided, we're just gonna shut down NBC Sports Network, NBCSN. We're gonna move some of those sports over to USA and we're gonna move some of those sports over to Peacock. We're gonna help try to build Peacock and then we're gonna ride USA all the way into the, the cord cutting future and, and see how far we can go with that. So I, that's what we're gonna end up seeing uh, in 2022, 2023 are sort of skinnier bundles with, um, with, with a lot more flexibility in terms of what the distributors can, uh, can offer to their consumers. I like how you said that, riding USA into the cord cutting future. It sounds glorious. <laughs> I'm sure my my editors would like edit that out somehow. I mean, my God, but that's that, amazing. I also find, that's you an mentioned amazing that. line. <laughs> you, you I, I'm like picturing, uh, I'm picturing like the NBC executives on like white horses, like just riding <laughs> into the cord cutting future. Here they go. Yeah, they got the Kentucky Derby. They're they're like they're using the, the the crop and and, and heading out. But that's also funny because you mentioned the ACC network and as NBC Sports Network is, is shutting down, ESPN is shutting down ESPN Classic. You know, the, you can see where everything is going. The ACC and ESPN have decided this is a great time to launch a, a linear channel. It flies against the, um, the, uh, the business strategy of every other programming network out there. I mean, everything is going streaming now, but like ACC, it's, a, it's an old time linear network that just got carriage on a, on Comcast, so the biggest cable operator in the country. It's a it's it's one that I'll be watching over the next couple of years to see sort of how that 
helps or hurts the ACC moving forward. All right, we moved to topic five. We talked about this earlier uh, with Rachel Nichols, who received my who's down uh, for the year. Maria Taylor, she moved to NBC. Uh, it was There's a lot of attention on this move, um, in part because of the New York Times story, which published Rachel Nichols' a private comment she made down the, during uh, about a year earlier in the Orlando bubble, um, where she didn't know she was being recorded. And she said, basically, uh, that she felt like she was about to lose her uh, job as the host of the NBA Finals and Countdown uh, to Maria Taylor, because in her opinion, in Nichols' opinion, uh, ESPN executives had a bad record on diversity. Um, nothing was done for a year. And then the time story comes out. At that point, Maria Taylor was also already basically gone from ESPN. So she leaves uh, and she ends up on the Olympics. Uh, that was a big story this year uh, with, uh, with all those uh, fac factors uh, coming together uh, that became explosive. And it wasn't only a sports media news. It was kind of a general news story. It was so big. Amazing. Uh, what we're doing at 2021 retro retrospective, and that's the first time that we brought up the Summer Olympics uh, is one aspect there. But I, I have just a question for you. I was surprised that NBC provided a landing spot for Maria Taylor in the middle of all this controversy. Where, did that did that catch you off guard at all, Andrew? Well, if you followed my reporting, no. Uh, so <laughs> I uh, I wrote NBC very early on as a possibility, and it obviously as I got to know more and more, it became much stronger. And then I had the story that she was going to actually be at the Olympics, um, which was right after her contract ended. Look, Maria Taylor is very talented on, on air. She's very good uh, as a host. Uh, I think she'll, you know, probably end up hosting maybe the Super Bowl uh, this year. I know she's going to be part of it, but she might just be the main host, I think, uh, because Tariko uh, is going to be off to do the Olympics. It's not really surprising to me that uh, she had opportunities uh, with MB NBC. Uh, I don't think, you know, I think she wanted to move on. She made that clear. Um, there's a lot of stuff that went on behind the scenes uh, between uh, Rachel Nichols and Maria Taylor. Uh, and so, you know, the fighting that became public over this spot um, was something that had been going on for a long time uh, between the two of them uh, for that position. And it's so interesting how that became such a big deal. And then you watch the halftime show during the NBA finals and it's literally like three minutes of on air time and 11 or 12 of commercials. Uh, but, but it was a big deal. No, I wasn't surprised that, that, that she found a spot with NBC. I mean, I, I think I could see the ability that Maria Taylor has. Yeah, to me, the, this is also a real indictment of, uh, of ESPN management, uh, in my opinion, because they did let this fester for a year and they papered over it in a way that, you know, if, if you take this to any business school, you know, it, it would be a, a, a how to of how not to handle something like this happening. You know, they basically it's allowed two of their biggest NBA stars to, oh, you don't have to talk to each other and we'll work around it instead of trying to figure out how to make it work together. Uh, that, that's one aspect of it. Um, the other two, Andrew, and I mentioned this earlier, is ultimately, I think ESPN ended up benefiting from everything because it enabled them to just blow up their studio shows around the NBA, completely reimagine them. And, I, 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 and, and they've come out with, a, you know, Mike Greenberg as a host. You know, they have Magic, Stephen A. and Wilbon as analysts. They all seem to get along. They seem to have a natural chemistry uh, among the three of them. And it, it's, uh, it's nowhere near where TNT is, of course, with Inside the NBA. But it's, a, it's not a bad listen, in my opinion. Yeah, I, look, we can look at it however you want. But I will say that over the preceding few years, they kept uh, saying how great the jump was with Rachel Nichols and how that show is you know, making inroads and it's part of the NBA conversation every day. And they seem pretty proud of it until they weren't. Uh, from what I could tell. Uh, and then in terms of Maria Taylor, uh, as I reported, they offered her at one point uh, nearly $5 million, um, I think, or a contract that would escalate the $5 million. And even at the end, I think they're offering around three, um, if I remember my reporting correctly. Uh, and so at least in that neighborhood, so they tried to keep her. So 
I guess you can give him credit for uh, re uh, doing all these studio shows. It, it doesn't seem like it was totally by design, uh, just where they ended up uh, after the time story and, and everything became public. Uh, they felt like they had a, a redo uh, and that's what they've done. All right, let's move to topic six. And this has really become like a life of its own on the pod. Amazon joins in the fun. They get into the NFL Thursday night exclusive programming game coverage starting this upcoming year in the fall. Uh, it's a big deal. Oh, it's a big deal for the NFL. <laughs> <laughs> look, I keep going, keep going. Look, look, I just went through all of the deals that Burke Magnus did. MLB, NHL, PGA Tour, La Liga, SEC. Where's Amazon? They're not there. I think one of the one of the main. Yeah, teams. I gotta stop you. I gotta stop. You. Okay, this is one of the things that you're getting wrong, and I'll let you continue. I hate to interrupt you, okay? But I need to do it here. Oh, I want to hear this. Yes, you're acting like for Amazon, they're forty plus years old, like ESPN. Except for them, they it's 1985 for them. If we talk about ESPN years, so ESPN was uh, started in 1979, and then. They started to grow and grow in 1987. They got the NFL. Uh, and so that's where Amazon is. You you think they should go from zero to 100 in one year. And instead of, you can see it gradually going up and they're going to do more deals. And it's going to be different. Like their, their business model isn't necessarily to get everything. They're going to pick and choose. And it's a different, they're not programming a 24 seven network. So that's where to be blunt, I think you're very mistaken. ESPN in 1987, God, that, I think that was the year they got the NFL, right? And they split it with Turner in 1987. They weren't owned by uh, Cap Cities yet. They weren't owned by Disney. They were just this teeny little crappy cable company. Amazon has these pockets. They're owned by the richest man on the globe. They have uh, the, the whole point of the digital media and the digital future is you can jump right into things. Why not? They, no, they can... you're wrong again. You're wrong about that too, John. I'm just going to say wrong, 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 wrong. You're wrong because the problem for Amazon is they have no infrastructure. That's why they have to do a deal with NBC uh, to for Sunday Night Football, where Fred Gidelli, they're the Sunday Night producer for Sunday Night Football, is now going to be the producer for Amazon. Uh, in terms of that, they're going to get Al Michaels most likely. Uh, 93%, uh, 1% higher on the meter. I, no, um, I have it at 99%. 99%. Okay. But they don't have that infrastructure. So that prevent, not that they couldn't do these deals, they could, but if you're the leagues and you have NBC, like who would you rather go with? If you're the premier league, NBC, you know, it does a great job, very popular. You have the relationship. They're offering you uh, an amazing deal or Amazon, even if Amazon had offered more and from all our reporting, I don't think they did, but let's just say they did. You still would go with Amazon. I don't think so. If I were consulting a league, I would say you need to be on broadcast because once you go to Amazon or once you go to a streaming service, you're only going to go to your hardcore fans and the, your next deal is going to become worse uh, ultimately. But I, I, I want to put this back on you. So for Amazon, they're, they're going to get big in sports. Uh, they 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 have a deal with uh, for Thursday night football, the worst of all the packages by far, uh, and and uh, they're they're likely to to buy half of the uh, NFL media um, assets. That's something I predicted. You've you've reported here out as well. What is the next step outside of the NFL that Amazon is going to take, in your opinion, or should they take, in your opinion? for U.S. sports in the U.S. sports media environment? Because that's where I'm just not seeing anything. NBA. So that's three years away. Uh, 2025, I think that they're going to probably get part of that NBA package. I'm not, I shouldn't say, no, I, I don't want to be so strong with that. I think that that's one that they should really kick the tires on and very strongly to see where that fits in. And does this work? I, I guess the issue that we're having is you think they should go and buy the Super Bowl as if the NFL would want to do that, or if Amazon would want to do it, they got to see if this works. I, I mean, obviously they're committed to the NFL. It's a 12 year agreement. So they're going to be doing this for a long time, but you don't just, you have to build. So they're building these relationships. 
And now 11, 12 years from now, um, we'll still be doing the podcast talking about this. It'll be like, <laughs> they'll just get, they'll get the Super Bowl. You'll be like, finally, they're a big you know story. What? 11 or 12 years from now, they're going to own ESPN and they'll, they'll be in sports and we'll both be right, kind of. Yeah, exactly. We'll both uh, be unemployed. But you don't start like that. They got the, I don't understand why you like act as if like the NFL. Because, I, because they're not part of the, the conversations. The EPL is the first conversation they, they were actually a part of. They, 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 they're not even close to, to getting any of these rights that are coming Because they don't want the minor. So look, we had Steve Bornstein on, former uh, head of ESPN, top NFL executive who who's partly responsible for all a these- big get, A big get. Yeah. Big get. Partly responsible for all these deals. He said two things about the what drives people to um, platforms. And if you look at the history of media and sports media, the NFL, domestically, internationally, EPL and soccer, but mostly EPL. Okay. So what has- Amazon done domestically. They got the NFL around the world. They've been sucking up EPL and soccer rights and cricket. Another one that's in. so that's where they're doing. They're shopping at the top. Their relationships in New York with the Yes Networks, with the New York Yankees. That's the premier franchise in all of baseball. It's obvious. They're, yeah. So it's not. So I feel that if they were serious about sports, you're saying like, oh, they, they don't have a, you could be the ESPN plus of sports they could have done it those are those rights were out there for a song and and espn has proved that you don't need to set up like a uh, you don't need to bring over fred Gadelli to do the ivy league games on on espn plus like if they really wanted to, to to become really big at sports and own sports they have the deep pockets to do it they have the, the tech technically they're able to do it and and you you contract out and hire out but it doesn't happen overnight. Well, it's time. been happening. I've been writing about them doing it for a decade now. I mean, at what point are you going to, are you, are they going to take the step forward? How many times has the NFL rights come up over that decade? Once? So they're, they're very big in the NFL. You're right. And that's the they, most important one. It's not even close. They're, they're very big. They're very big in the NFL because they have the worst package out of all the packages. And that package next, next year is going to get the lowest viewership in the history of the NFL going back to 1987 when it was on this crappy little uh, cable network. I'll give you that. That will be a story. Next week, we're going to do the looking ahead uh, and what we think. That is going to be a major story come the fall. I grant you that. Amazon's a big deal. But when the streaming numbers, which will be public, come out and they're compared to the ratings, everyone's going to say, nobody's watching this. I can't find the game. I can't wait for the spin coming out of the NFL on that. That'll be great. Yeah, that will be fun. But they'll say, yeah, they're building something. And also, this is the other thing that I'm going to give you a point that you've missed here. I'm going to give you a point that you missed is that nobody else wanted this Thursday night package. And the NFL <laughs> that, dollars from actually, Amazon. That's, a, that's another, that, that, that's an give you a layup. true point. I give you a layup. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I got to argue right. both sides now. <laughs> give me the Martian and Martian Sports Media Podcast next year. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. That is good. Anything else? Any mystery topics you want to add before we go to our calls of the year? We'll, calls let's of the year. Let's, go, let's go right to the calls of the year. I can't. All right. Let's them. do it. Let's give, let's give our voice over one more calls of the week. Call of the week. Some people want to get rid of that voiceover. I love her. I want her to stay. So my yeah, I, don't know. I, think firmly... I think we probably need it in the topics. We might need some outros. Um, you know what? Over the holidays, we'll, we'll go deep dive into that. Um, I'm going to make your assignment to listen to all 12 shows and see which, one, <laughs> <laughs> which sounds better. And then you can give up before. No, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, I, I look, I, I think we've a lot of, there's been a lot of discussion about that. There's gonna be a podcast about the podcast. Yeah, what should they do? Absolutely. How, how did we not put our podcast is on the way up? I mean, come on. Oh uh, yeah. All right. We used that. We broke a lot of stories too. I wouldn't have said that too. I know. Yeah. I got it. I think on the pound on the back, it's like, we're, we're the best calls of the year. You want to go first? Or you want me to? Yeah. Let me go first. I can't get enough. 2021. What a great year for Pat McAfee. Let's listen to a call that uh, he he's on uh, WWE on Fox on Friday nights. Let's listen to one of his calls. When the plane touched down in Cleveland today, I took a nice deep breath in. The air off of Lake Erie smelled so good. 
The city of Cleveland smelled like blue collar greatness. It smelled like championships were on the way. It smelled like. It smelled like tonight was going to be the greatest SmackDown in the history of SmackDowns. Look, this is less about that individual call and just more about McAfee. What he has done with his career is something I've never seen before. I mean, he retired from the Colts. He was a punter on the Colts. He retired, joined Barstool, then quit them and just for formed his own media company. He could have gone from Barstool. He had ESPN, Fox. He was doing games for them. It was a traditional way that on-air talent was going. But he decided that he was going to launch his own company. He was going to still call those games for Fox and ESPN launched a radio show on Sirius, made it available to YouTube, and you know, just this month to a $120 million deal with FanDuel. I just think that it is such a unique, different way for, uh, for somebody to get into sports media. And I take my hat off for him for having vision to, to see this. Yeah, $120 million, that's, it seems like it was a good decision. Uh, you know, the way he tells it when he came out that he didn't get the big interest from the mainstream uh, media, uh, then, like you just said, uh, ESPN came calling, Fox came calling, uh, and he's just built it up. But he also has really good instincts uh, and or advice that he's getting. But really, you got to give him the credit because at the end of the day, he's making the decision uh, because he said, you know, I could he could go. I think he could have replaced Levitard. I think there's a chance he could have replaced Levitard at one point uh, when Levitard left. But he said, look, I got a better opportunity. And we've talked about this, a big theme of the podcast, direct to consumer. He's a perfect example on an individual level of being able to go directly because you don't need ESPN or CBS or NBC's pipes to get your message out. You can just use uh, YouTube. Uh, and then he has other deals that he can make off of that. But the base is YouTube which any of us can use. This show is also distributed uh, video-wise through YouTube. So anybody can be on YouTube. What, what's our license fee with YouTube? What, what are they paying? They're paying yeah. us a rights deal, right? We are in deep negotiations on that. <laughs> Look for a big announcement. Well, the one, th one thing about McAfee, though, is if he went that traditional route, he'd be a star. He'd be making close to Stephen A. Smith money. I, 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 I don't think he would be, actually. I just don't think the execs would give it to him. I, don't, I think also he can just monetize it much better because it's basically... He's just taking the middle man out of it and he's just going to the advertiser instead of giving a big check to Disney and ESPN. He's just receiving that big check directly to himself. And that's why the idea that FanDuel and these betting platforms are becoming media companies in a sense, a little bit they are, but they're also just kind of just infusing money into media without that infrastructure, at least not yet. They have some infrastructure uh, with some of the deals they've done and some of the people they've brought in, but it's not they're not full-fledged. Maybe we'll get there, but that's kind of really a sponsorship deal uh, with FanDuel and McAfee. Who do you have? Who's your call of the year, 2021? Let's hear right, it. Mine's an honor. Uh, Marv Albert retiring after a legendary career, 55 years calling games, uh, in New York, he's a legend. Uh, you know, the one thing that uh, can't be overlooked is how many of the current day sportscasters, uh, especially in this area, grew up uh, impersonating and wanting to be like Marv on the air. Uh, and so after 55 years, uh, we don't hear this anymore. Jordan. And the thing about Marv, yes, uh, in that call with Jordan, a spectacular move by Michael Jordan. It's just so good. Uh, at his peak, the best NBA play-by-player -play -player of all time. Just a great voice, an identifiable voice. Like you said, everybody has their Marv Albert imitation, right? Good or bad. Yes. You know, it's, it's a. It, it, I'm not going to do mine. Mine's bad. I guess I just did you it. You just did really yours. Bad. I just heard yours on the yeah, joke. It wasn't good. <laughs> that was, we that was awful. That we, we that's as bad as mine. <laughs> but Marv deserves all his credit and, uh, and uh, just a, a legendary career. So he gets my call of the year. Yeah. Amen to that one. All right, John, for us, uh, this was, it's been fun for us to add the sports media podcast. We're going to be back next week 
looking ahead. So over your holiday season, uh, between Christmas and New Year's, uh, look for that. Uh, and we will look ahead to what's in store for 2022. And we appreciate everybody listening and subscribing. And if you say nice things, that's very nice of you as well. It's been a hoot, man. Thanks for listening. <laughs>